we're going to begin to lay out the vision we believe God has given our church. I believe what we're going to communicate the next three or four weeks will set the course of our church for the next ten years. I really believe that in prayer this week, I, I felt like God said, what, what I'm going to communicate to the church will set the course for the next ten years. So I just, this morning, as me and my wife communicate, we're just listening to the Holy Spirit, we're obeying what He has told us to say this week, but we're going to also speak prophetically. So, it might come across a little bit different than it normally does. But before my wife comes, I want to release all of our kids. I just wanted our kids to hear that before they were released this morning. God bless all of our kids. And AJ and Jennifer for pouring into our kids. Thank you, AJ and Jennifer. It's a blessing. So, the first word that describes the vision of the house, and more and more we're becoming this, is simply the word pray. We've been on this journey for three years, where God has, where we are becoming a house of prayer. We're becoming a house of prayer. We, we aren't there yet, but, but God is bringing us on this journey. Remember, remember what the Lord said. He didn't say that my house will be a house of worship, or a house of teaching, or a house of evangelism. He said that my house will be a house of prayer. Matthew 21, 13. So our confession, our statement, and what we are, what, what we are as a body of believers, as a spiritual family, is Lifehouse Church is a house of prayer. So with that, I want my wife to come, and I asked her to speak this morning, because I want you all to hear from her. Come on, give her a hand as she comes. Do I get a spot? Okay. And, and the reason I wanted you to hear from her is because um, she's, a, she's a big part of what we do here at Lifehouse Church. How many know that? Yeah. And the Lord has released such a passion in her for prayer and uh, being a house of prayer. And God's using her now, you know, uh, in a tremendous way. So I want you all to hear her heart, and all that the Lord is, is doing in her and, and, and revealing to her. Okay. All right. It was, he called me, and he, he said he was going to get me to share, and then I was like, okay, there's so much what to do in 15 minutes. <laughs> and so um, I'm just going to share with you what's burning in the forefront of my heart at this moment, I can say, um, I'll just give you a little bit of a of background, because I don't know if everybody knows me, but I was valedictorian in my high school. Now, when I gave my valedictorian speech, I gave the Great Commission. <laughs> it was probably the strangest valedictorian speech, you know, in the history of, uh, of you know, speeches, I guess. But I remember afterwards, this man came up to me. And I remember I was, at the, I was at the back doors and I was trying to leave and this man came up to me and he said, you're an intercessor. Do you want to come to our intercession meetings? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I just smiled, but I remember thinking, no way. <laughs> Y'all are weird. <laughs> no way am I coming to the intercession meeting you know, with y'all. But I would go to five o'clock prayer with my uncle, and I did love prayer. But, but I think about that often because I was like, oh my gosh, you wove this in me from the very beginning of time. Just like Stephen was talking about, you wove this into my DNA because this is who you are, God. You, Jesus, you sit and you 
intercede for us night and day. You are the great intercessor. It is uh, no accident. And sometimes our view is a little, you know, like, I don't know, prayer room, they sit in a the chair, there's, what, what do you do? You know, what do you do? There's worship going on, like, what do I ask? Do I just ask stuff? Do I sit? What do I do? Well, um, this is the dream of God. It has always been the dream of God. And recently, it's just been, the in the forefront of it has been, we all know David, right, from the Bible, what, who is he known as? What is the title that he's given? I mean, he's got a couple of them. The man after God's own heart. What if God said that about you or us? Those are the ones after my heart. So what is God's heart? What is God's heart? So you read the story of David. When you read the story of David and you read what he, you know, who he is and what he was, and he was the shepherd boy, huh? He's the youngest. He was on the backside of the mountain. He wasn't the one that was doing all of the awesome things, awesome things that his brothers were doing. But he was on the backside of the mountain. He was taking care of the sheep. He was learning the father's heart right? He was the one you read about in Psalms where it says, I gaze, anything, don't take, you can take everything from me, but this one thing that I ask, let me always gaze on you and learn from you. Why? Because his life was on the backside of the mountain doing his job in excellence, but looking in the heavens. His eyes were set on one thing. What did he see? What did he see that made him vow a vow that changed history? He vowed a vow that changed history. It changed history for us because he understood the heart of God. He made a vow. And I think that when you hear the vision of this house, it's God's dream. It's not our dream. You know, it's just like he was saying, it's your, jo- your job or anything like that. Look, I, I love my job. I work at the gym. It's not because I chose to work there. God told me to work there. I told Stephen, I feel like God said, go there. I went there. I love it. But it's not because I chose it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not because we choose it. We begin to love things because we give our yes to Jesus. We give our yes to him, and then we step into the dream that he has for us, and we're like, you're so smart. I love this way more than I thought I ever would. And so this is what David did. He began to see the worth of the father on the backside of the mountain. His eyes were open, and I believe if we as a church, you begin to say, you know what? I'm going to give my yes to you. I'm going to set my heart, because David sets his heart. He begins to set his heart in a direction that says, my yes is yours. Why? Because my eyes have seen what heaven is doing. My eyes see the worth of the Father, the worth of the Messiah that's coming, the King that's coming. This is the issue with the church. The church doesn't see the worth of Jesus really. That's just the truth. That's why we're consumed with ourselves. That's why when we work in the sound booth or we work, we're, we're a leader or we're this, we want pats all about ourselves instead of saying, I'm just giving my yes. Keep me on the backside of the mountain. I don't need anything but to give Jesus his dream. What did David say? Better is one day. I'll be a doorkeeper. Jesus brought me to that place. As long as I can open the door for you, for your presence to come in, this is the place I want to be. I'm going to build your house. I don't care if I get recognition for it. Let me be the doorkeeper. As long as you get to come in, you come into the state, you come into the nation, put me at the door. Make me a doorkeeper. I don't care. But my dream is to live for you. My vow is to give you your resting place. This is the dream. David was on the backside of the mountain. What is the house of prayer? What is the house of prayer? 
It's where God finds his resting place. Can he find his resting place here? What is rest? Where someone doesn't have to struggle with you anymore. I don't wrestle with God anymore. Dwell in me. That's what our hearts say. I'm not going to wrestle against you. I don't know if I like that vision. I don't know if I want to do that, Jesus. Give me your yes. Let me have my dwelling place inside of you. And then the earth, everywhere you walk, peace will begin to flow. In this house, if we say, I vow to build your house to find the dwelling place of the Lord so that the presence of God can come in immeasurable measuring. You know what I mean? Like, like un, indescribable, like, like where people fall on their face and they don't even know what's going on. We haven't seen that. There have been awakenings in the earth where it comes for a little bit, where full regions, that's what we want. There's a dwelling place that he is worth. And if the people of God, if we can say, you know what, I'm not living for me. I'm living for your dream. That's what David said. He said, no, I know what you want. You want a place where you can dwell without struggling, where you can rest, where there's a people who say, I see your worth. I see your worth. And I'm going to give you the worship that heaven gives you. It's going to be heaven on earth. David saw heaven. He saw the one who can do anything, who can make clouds his chariot. That's why he said, he said, you know, he heard the stories when he was young and the, the presence of the Lord, the ark was lost. And he vowed in Psalms 132 that I'm going to set, I've heard the stories, how it was lost in the woods. And I'm going to, when I become king, because obviously he made this after he was told he was king, because he heard the stories, when I, I'm going to find you the dwelling place. This is what I set my heart to do. I set my heart, Psalms 57 says, my heart is set, it's fixed, oh God. My heart is steadfast and I will sing and I will make melody and I will awake my inner glory. Awake harp, awake lyre, I will awake right early and I will awaken the dawn. My voice will awaken the dawn. Every, when I sing, everybody will know who I'm singing to because it's not about me. It's about the one who's worthy. And if our house, this house, because God's eyes stopped on David behind the mountain and said his heart's loyal. If, his, if the eyes of the Lord have stopped here and said the heart's loyal, he's saying, now set your heart. Set your heart. This is not a fad. This is not another model. This is my dream from the beginning. And if I can get a people to set their gaze on me and see my worth and worship, not for the accolades of man, but for me, I will come down and I will rest. Not for just a Sunday morning, not for just maybe a weekend when you have a conference, but I will find my dwelling place. It will be the house of prayer for all nations because you'll get to see the mysteries inside of my heart. And you'll understand when you lift, my, lift your voice to me, I move. Not for yourself, but for the earth. It's an intercession. It's prayer. It's, wor it's worship to the one who's worthy. This is what he did. And he, he kept his vow. He set the ark of the presence the, of God in his rightful place. And the presence came. He made the dwelling place of God first in him on the backside of the mountain. And then he said, oh, no, I know what you want. You got it here. We're going to find you a dwelling place. And, yes, it will be geographical. Yes, Zion, in your backyard, that five acres, put my ark in the tent first. Then we're going to go from there. That's what he wants to do in Louisiana. That's what he wants to do in the nation. That's what he's doing in the earth until every nation sings. House of prayer for all nations. <laughs> until every nation sings. Because that's how he's coming back. When the bride lifts her voice because he sees the worth of Jesus. Come, Jesus, come. Now, you'll bear a stigma. I bear one. All the time. Are you going to talk about the bridegroom again? You gonna, yes, I am. 
because he's worth it. Yes, I am, because he's worth it. You're going to talk about the prayer room again? Yes, I am, because it's his dream. I don't live for myself. You weren't the one that crawled in bed with me when I lost my baby. He did. You weren't the one that came and wanted me when I denied him. He came back and got me. <laughs> my heart is his. I will build his house all my days. All my days, right? And I, I say that that's the declaration of this house. That's the declaration of this house. You have to say, will I do it? Because David's vow was radical. He said, I'm not even going to let sleep come to my eyes until I find the dwelling place of the one that sits on the throne. I'll do whatever it takes. It becomes a radical call. It becomes, an, you know, that's uncomfortable. Y'all, I love this vision. I live for it. Do I like to get up every Wednesday morning and come here? No. Every Wednesday morning, when my alarm goes off at 4 a.m., I'm like, I got a headache. I'm sleepy. I worked out. I worked out real hard. I did too many extra classes. All that every Wednesday. Get up, Laura. Reset your heart. Keep your vow. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not because it's, woo, it's so fun all the time. No, it, it rages against your flesh constantly. But you have to reset your eyes and you say, no, you're worth it. You're worth it. It's a radical vow. It's a radical commitment to the Lord. And so I think I went over my time. Did I? I'm okay? So... That's the passion of the vision, <laughs> you know, some of it. So you read the story, read the story of, you know, it's not the fad of the house of prayer. I mean, God started speaking in 2006 to me about this, and he said, you're going to be the bride, and you're going to be the house of prayer. He's talking about here. I remember I was standing right there. Sissy Callie was sitting in a chair, and I was preaching. At, I was looking at her little face. Because it's his heart. It's his dream. And let me tell you, it's happening all over the earth. It's been happening. But I'm telling you, it is accelerating. So do you know what that means? Do you understand what God's end time plan is? Read the book. It's this. So we, I see it accelerating in the houses, in the churches, outside, all over all over, he is igniting hearts. Vows are being made to God because eyes are seeing his worth. And, it, and you can't stop it. So I'm jumping in. I'm like, I'm not getting left out. I'm jumping right in. And so he stopped on this house. And so when you hear the vision of the house, this is Psalms 132. The psalmist is, is reliving. He's saying, I want the overflow of David's heart. This is the heart this is the vow that David made. I want to live in that overflow. That's what I'm saying to God all the time. I want to live in this overflow. The heart of David, the man that was after God's heart. I want to live in that stream. I want to see what he saw. I want, to, I want my heart to love God like he loves. I want to keep my vow like him. So when you hear the vision, this is, this is the heart behind the vision. This is the heart behind the vision. You read the story, First Chronicles, all in there, and then you see the passion of David's heart in Psalms 132. So that's what I wanted to share with you, that we're going to commit, and we're going to say whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, I'll take the night hours. Whatever it takes, I'll take, oh, my gosh, what about the Psalms that says, uh, the ones that serve in the house of the Lord by night. Those are the sweetest hours, y'all. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking. I got pink shoes on. Y'all coming to pink incense? Okay. Amen. That was great, huh? Well, I'm just going to share just a few things this morning. And then I'm going to pick it back up next week because it's 1122. And I just wanted you to hear uh, my wife's heart uh, this morning. Uh, you know, me and my wife, I felt like the next phase of our ministry that uh, Laura and I will be doing more together, communicating together, uh, talking about the vision together. And uh, so... You, you will be seeing more of her 
communicating in that way. So, I really feel like the Lord uh, wants us to expedite what's going here to other places in Louisiana. And I feel like uh, the next phase of that is, uh, you know, for Laura and I to be uh, ministering more and more together. And uh, it's this heart, uh, you know, for the presence of God. You know, that's what David possessed, is he had given his life to go after presence. And he said, uh, I don't care about anything but the very presence of the Lord. And that's why he had a heart after God's own heart. He, his heart was totally after him. You know, in uh, Psalms 132, which Laura quoted out of a lot and in, in which she ministered there, David's heart was that he would see God come and, and rest. And in that, he said, I'm not going to give sleep to my eyelids. I'm not even, I'm not even going to go in the comfort of my bedroom. And so David realized that if I want all of God, then if it takes me not even sleeping, it will be worth it. And that, that's the heart of the house of prayer. And I understand that, that not everybody's there yet. Everybody's like, okay, I, I'm just trying to, to get to where I can just pray a little bit every day. And, and that's a good starting place. And we all need to say, you know, my goal is to pray 10 minutes today or 20 minutes today. But ultimately, our heart has to be at a place, God, whatever it takes for me to have your presence in my life, that's what I'm going to do. How, whatever it takes for you to have your, your, your power in my life, that's what I'm going to do. And so, that, that's the place that God is calling us, Laura and I. And so, if God's calling us to that place, you know, that's the place God's calling you to. How many can receive that? And so, I just want to encourage you this morning that God is calling you to a lifestyle of prayer. And that's where you will experience Jesus like you've never experienced Him before. You know, one of the greatest indictments on the church today is that prayer is an afterthought. Prayer is not the driving force. And the a good example of that is that Prayer meetings are the least attended meetings out of any church meetings. And people show how much they value prayer in that they think they can do better things than their time than come to a prayer meeting. And that's the sad reality. And, and sometimes there is, there is the, the thought, I don't know how to connect in, in prayer meetings, I don't know how to connect to the prayer movement. I like what Dad says, if you just come here and soak in God's presence, it's worth it. You don't have to come to the mic and, and, and pray, every, pray anything over the mic. But just coming and being a part of corporate prayer, what God is doing corporately in prayer, is important. Are you hearing me? It's very, very important. Remember, the more we pray, the more God gets involved in the affairs of men. We invite God more, the more we pray, we invite Him more and more into our life, into our community, into our region, and what He's doing. Prayer first starts with humility. That's the first. People that are prideful and arrogant, they don't pray. Because they think they can handle it themselves. They think they got life figured out. So they have, they have very little prayer life. But people that are desperate, people that are dependent, people that know they need God, pray. They know they need prayer. 
I like what Corey Ten Boone said. She said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Prayer is a lot of people's spare tire. They only use it in an emergency. You hear me? Leonard Ravenhill said this, a sinning man stops praying. One of the first things that goes in your spiritual life when you've invited sin back into your life is your prayer life. But he said this, a praying man stops sinning. If you want sin to be eradicated from your life, where you have no hunger for sin, and start praying. I mean, the more you pray, the more you get a hunger to prayer. You can't go a day without prayer. So, today, you need to ask yourself, what am I hungry for? Am I sitting here today Hungry for the wrong things? Because what you feed yourself, that's what you will be hungry for. But as you develop an appetite for prayer and getting into the Word of God, you will experience dimensions of God you have never experienced your whole Christian life. You'll be like, why didn't I do this before? What was wrong with me? Because the enemy keeps you from a life of prayer. He keeps you distracted. He keeps you hungry for the wrong things. He keeps you hungry for entertainment. You know, the average person today, the average young person, 25 and younger, spends three to six hours on social media every day. But they have no time to pray. So the first thing we need to do before we enter a lifestyle of prayer is repent for prayerlessness. Can I get an amen? Amen. Say, God, I repent for living a lifestyle of little to no prayer. God, I want to connect with you all of my days in prayer. I never want to lose my hunger for prayer. I never just want to settle for, for, for just barely getting by in my Christian walk. I want more of you, like we sang this morning, more of you. I want more of your presence in my life. More of your, and never let me settle. That needs to be our prayer. Jesus, until I see you face to face, that I would never settle. That every day I will want more of you, more of your presence, more of your power, more of you shining through me, more of you just doing great and wonderful things through my life. I want to end with this verse today. And I'm going to save the the bulk of the message for next Sunday because I want to have plenty of running room to say what the Lord wants me to say. But I believe that God is calling us like He called David to a psalm's 42 lifestyle. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn there. And we're going to end this message on prayer with prayer. And this, we're going to pray this scripture. Psalms 42. This sums up David's life. As the deer pants for water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. This is the vision of the house. This is our first step of the vision, is the prayer of the vision. That we can say like David, hear me today, that that you and I can say like David, God, my soul pants for you. 
My soul longs for you. My, my, my soul desires you like the deer for the water brooks. God, my soul thirsts for you. God, I hunger and thirst after you. God, more than anything in this life, my soul hunger and thirst for you. So what, what is God calling us to be? God is calling us to be a Psalm 42 people. How many can receive that? Now I believe that God is calling us to, as far as building the house of prayer, God is calling us to greater levels of that this year. And I believe we're going to see more and more of that in the days to come. But this is where it starts right here. That our soul longs for God. There's a a desire and thirst for God. You know, there's, there's people in the Bible that were able to get places in God. And God was able to do things for them and through them that he wasn't able to do through other people. And why is that? Why is that if God is not a respecter of person? That God was able to do things for some people that he was not able to do for other people. These people were able to get places in God and go after God and and have miracles and breakthroughs, and, and they were able to have nearness to God that, that some people were never able to get to. The answer to that is one word. Desperation. Desperation determines your nearness to God. If you remember the story... Of the Canaanite woman. She came to Jesus. And she said, Jesus, my daughter is severely demon possessed. I need you to come and heal her. And Jesus didn't even respond to her. He acted like he didn't even hear her. Has God ever acted like, or you thought he didn't hear you? You were like, God, do you even hear what I'm saying? I'm talking to you. I need help. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Why are you not answering me? But that didn't stop her. She went to his disciples and she said, Hey, I need some help. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And, and the disciples told her to be quiet. They said, be quiet, woman. You're, 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 you're causing a disturbance. Jesus has more important things to do. Then she didn't stop there. Then she said, Lord, I need your help. My daughter is severely demon possessed. And Jesus answered her. And he said, what I have is for the house of Israel. It's not for you, woman. But she, she didn't, she kept on asking. She did not allow obstacles and barriers to deter her from getting her answer from Jesus. She said it one more time. She said, Jesus, my daughter is severely demon possessed. I need your help. And Jesus said, the children's bread is not for the little dogs. Jesus called this woman a dog. It didn't deter her. She used that offensive language that Jesus used and she said, even the little dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. You understand 
But going after God and, and having that desire and hunger and desperation, you don't stop, you don't quit, you don't let obstacles, barriers, people, demons shut you up. And God told the woman, she said, Oh, woman, great is your faith. What you ask is done for you. Desperation. Are you going to give up? Are you going to settle? Come on, let's go after God. Let's do everything He's called us to do. As a people, as a church. Y'all ready for 2018?